Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Especially any visitors uh, with us today, you're very welcome uh, to this presentation on Lexio Divina by uh, Deacon Steve. Uh, before I start, I want to say two things. I'll, I'll have some public service announcements afterward on upcoming activities, but uh, two things I want to say now is if you're not getting my emails on these events, um, give your e and you want to give your email make sure you give your email to Jenny and I'll include you on my reminders of upcoming events uh, the other thing is uh, last week I lose track of time but last week Deacon Steve was here and he gave a uh, he gave a talk on the Carmelite martyrs of Compagnon 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 we have a French we have a French teacher back there so so that's the way it is Anyway, so, uh, and it was kind of based on this book, uh, so we have some copies. If you're interested, we're asking for a donation of $20, but, so if you're interested, we have a couple of them, and Ginny has them, so you can take advantage of that. Um, so again, this presentation on Lecture Divina by Deacon Steve, and I, and I want to say this now, I want to say, Deacon Steve, a man whom I can now safely say, I think, needs no introduction, <laughs> right? Third time here. Okay, you're, you're on. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I made sure, if, if anyone was here last week, I had left the Bible out here, and it made Joe really anxious because he didn't want to put anything on top of it. So I made sure to take it out of the way at the beginning. Uh, so why don't we begin with prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. And this is a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Lord, we ask that you be present with us today in our midst and then help us to draw ever closer to you by diving more deeply into your sacred scripture, your revealed word, so that we may get to know you better and draw closer to you. We ask the Holy Spirit, we ask that you send the Holy Spirit into our midst to enlighten our hearts and minds so that we may be more open to the ways in which you seek a relationship with us, to commune with us. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of your faithful people, grant them in that same spirit to be truly wise and ever to rejoice in your consolation. Through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Saint Damien, pray for us. Saint Jerome, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So I prayed for Saint Jerome's intercession there at the end, because if anyone doesn't know, Saint Jerome is like the patron saint of scripture study. He was a, a, a big proponent uh, and helped translate the scriptures into Latin, which then eventually helped lead to translating into all different languages to make the word of God accessible to people. Um, so today, uh, at, so at the beginning of the summer, Joe had asked like a different presentations I might want to give. And so I wasn't really sure like what to choose at the beginning. Um, so I just thought, he asked like, what are things you're passionate about or things that like that you would just be happy to share with people? And this was one of the first things that came to my mind because when I learned about this, I guess, it really just changed my whole spiritual life because I'm sure like for many of you, as is the, is the case for me often and certainly was the case before figuring this out, prayer is kind of hard, <laughs> isn't it? You know, like, like we are naturally as human beings, like we feel that thirst for God and we want to enter into communion with God and we want to pray, but we like don't know how to do it. You know, like we have you know, obviously our devotions that have kind of been passed down to us, maybe from our parents and grandparents, um, which are beautiful and good things. And we should do devotions, like especially the rosary thinking of different novenas, um, you know, all kinds of different types of prayer. Uh, but sometimes like maybe that feels kind of dry, you know, or you want to like go deep, you know, like I want to enter into like a deeper relationship with God. And I just don't know how to do that. You know, other people talk about God speaking to them, but why doesn't he speak to me? 
And that can be really frustrating and discouraging, and it might even like lead us to want to just abandon prayer altogether. Um, and so when I discovered this, it just like changed the game for me because it gave me just like a, I guess a context in which like I heard like the Lord's voice in like very particular ways that I hadn't heard before. Um, and, you know, we hear all these various saints talk about like contemplative prayer. And this is sort of like a gateway, you know, that can really help us like enter into the contemplative life and really like go deeper into our relationship with Christ himself. Um, through his revealed word, because as we know, as, as Christians, as Catholics, we believe that the scriptures are the inspired word of God. Like there are two authors of the scriptures. There were real human authors, but at the same time, the Holy Spirit was inspiring those real human author, authors so that God himself could manifest his presence through them so that people for all ages could be able to get in contact with him some way through the scriptures in the Bible. And it might be something that we're just not familiar doing, or maybe like we read the Bible and we're not really sure, you know, like what's, what's going on here? You know, I read these passages and I don't understand them. And so then like we get frustrated and we just kind of give up. So Lexio Divina or divine reading is what that literally means, um, is a practice of praying, not just reading and studying, but praying with the scriptures. Uh, that is very ancient and really goes back to the, to the Jewish people, and then in the early days of the church, it's something that became really, really popular and common in the context of monastic life, right? So this is what like monks would do because all day they're not, you know, busying themselves with worldly tasks, but they're dedicating their lives to constant communion with God and meditating and constantly pouring over the word of God, the scriptures, was how they just like enter into that relationship. And so... Uh, in the little like ad in the bulletin they put, there was like a quote from St. Augustine of how like when we pray, we talk to God, but then when we like meditate on his word, that's almost like him speaking back to us. Uh, and St. Jerome also famously said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ, uh, which is very, you know, poignant uh, term. And it might be a little striking to us if maybe we don't really read the Bible so much, you know. So I hope uh, what I present today, and I hope everyone has the handouts. I gave two little handouts, just with kind of like an outline for this um, that might like be helpful for us that going out from here today, if you want to try to pray with the scriptures, it sort of like gives us like a model to follow or just like steps, I guess, to kind of help enter into this, you know, like how does this work and how can I possibly like discern what it is like that the Lord might be saying to me. Um, in this moment. So I presented, I broke it down into like a couple steps. You might look like if you do research on this online or if you read different books, different people will like break this down in different ways. And there are all kinds of different ways to enter into it. And it's important for this, as with everything, like this is prayer. You know, it's not just like a, like a task, you know, like step one, do this, step two, do that. And you may find like as you start doing this on your own, that like following this model, if you will, or pattern seems kind of artificial or like kind of forced. Don't like feel like you have to like, okay, step one, do this. Step two, do that. It's not just a checklist with things to check off. It's prayer. So you kind of discern like, all right, where might the spirit be leading me in this? And you'll kind of find the more you do this, that the steps kind of start to blend together a little bit. But I wanted to try to break it down and present it kind of as simply as possible so that all of us, if we don't if we've never done this before and we want to try, it's a good way to kind of start taking those initial steps to enter into this contemplative prayer life through the practice of Lexio Divina. So without further ado, um, let's dive in. Also too, at the end, I don't plan to talk for super, super long. I have a bad habit of always talking longer than I want to talk. Um, but at the end, I passed out a scripture passage too, so that maybe at the end, we can just like kind of do this together you know, this could be a group activity where people kind of share their different inspirations and thoughts and insights, but it also can be something like done individually just as a way to enter in personal prayer with the Lord. But I thought maybe if we have some time at the end, we could kind of do this as a group. Um, and so I just picked this little passage um, and you'll know why I picked this passage. I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the plan. So vamos. So I put there the first uh, step, if you will. So I put for each of the steps, I put like the Latin word just because it looks cool and official. And then, <laughs> other than that, there's no other reason. 
you know, figure if we're doing something called Lexio Divina, we're using a Latin term, why not keep going with these Latin words? <laughs> Latin's cool. Uh, so the first one I put is statio, right? Think station, positioning. So before we enter like into any prayer, we have to like be in the right disposition of mind. Um, if anyone went to one of the masses that I preached at this weekend, I talked a lot about the need for silence in our life, the need to like remove ourselves from what we were doing. What did Jesus say? Go off by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. Basically implying that just as important as our apostolic ministry and going out and doing things for Christ is just being with him, being with him in silence, getting to know the shepherd. And the only way we can really do that is in silence. You guys all know so many people here have families and jobs. It's so hard to like calm yourself down, you know, because we're always running. We're doing so many things. We're taking care of things at home. Maybe the grandchildren are over, you know, things are hectic. Uh, maybe we, if we're still working, like maybe we're really busy with our jobs and we're always thinking about work. And we're always thinking about this and we're always thinking about that. That it can seem like our lives are just like a whirlwind. And that's a temptation even for us, like as clergy, even though our work is technically like, you know, ministry of trying to bring people to Christ. It's easy to get so caught up in that that you're never actually talking to him. So it's so important that we make silence. And so the only way that Lexio Divina, that we'll be able to really perceive Christ speaking to us in scripture is if we're able to like get ourselves to a place where we could receive that. You know, if we get to a time of prayer and our minds are just racing about, what am I going to eat for lunch? What is like the, the to-do list that I have today? I have to go and buy this, 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 and that. And I need to, you know, water the flowers. If we're thinking about all that stuff, if the Lord's trying to speak to us, it might just go like kind of right over our head. So we need to get ourselves in that place where we're able to just kind of be receptive and open to God's presence. So I put a quote here from St. Ignatius of Loyola. If anyone has ever heard of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, that's like what made the Jesuits a thing. You know, everyone here knows who the Jesuits are. Giving the spiritual exercises. And this is something he says in there that helped me immensely the first time I went on an Ignatian-style retreat. Which, by the way, if anyone gets a chance to go on an Ignatian retreat, it mostly consists of doing Lexio Divina. That's like the Ignatian model. It's like using your imagination and doing Lexio Divina. So St. Ignatius says, a step or two before the place where I have to contemplate or meditate, I will put myself standing for the space of an Our Father, my intellect raised on high, considering how God our Lord is looking at me, etc., and will make an act of reverence or humility. That is like the best way to enter into this, because as I said before, this is not just an academic task. We're not just reading this to learn something, but we're trying to enter into a conversation with God. And so the best and most helpful way to get our minds like in that place is to stop for a moment, quiet ourselves, and consider that God is looking at me. I find that so, so helpful because we're putting ourselves in that place of like, okay, I'm entering now into a dialogue. I'm ready to listen to what he's trying to say. And so that kind of sets the stage. And I found this great quote from Pope Benedict that I thought I would just put on there because he talks about the importance of silence, and then he connects it to Mary. And I thought that was really beautiful, so I'm just going to read it. The word, in fact, can only be spoken and heard in silence, outward and inward. Ours is not an age which fosters recollection. At times, one has the impression that people are afraid of detaching themselves, even for a moment, from the mass media. For this reason, it is necessary nowadays that the people of God be educated in the value of silence. Rediscovering the centrality of God's word in the life of the church also means rediscovering a sense of recollection and inner repose. The great patristic tradition teaches us that the mysteries of Christ all involve silence. Only in silence can the word of God find a home in us, as it did in Mary, woman of the word, and inseparably, woman of silence. I think that's just a beautiful quote, and I just wanted to put it on there, because I think we all can relate to that. Just being bombarded by media, uh, you know, by constant noise and articles and videos and podcasts and sound bites and whatever the heck else. Just so many things. And so he just talks about Mary as the model of living our life with a, that contemplative outlook and putting us in that place where we can just be receptive. And Mary was the one who was the most receptive, receiving the word himself to take flesh in her. Um, so awesome. So that's how, how we set the stage. Quiet yourself, recollect yourself, and 
recall that you're just in God's presence. So then the second part, or the, the first part, if you consider the first part kind of like a prelude, is lexio. So this is the actual reading of the text. So I find it helpful sometimes. There are different ways to do this. Some people will just kind of like continue reading, like until like something strikes them or whatever. I find it helpful to like before I start this, I know the passage I'm going to meditate on. Like you, you pick like one chapter, for example, of a gospel. Like this is what I want to pray with, or this is what I feel moved to pray with, given what's going on in my life right now. And so the first thing you do is just read the text. What does the biblical text say in itself? Just read it, and you have to read it slowly, right? So this is not just like reading some, you know, garbage novel on the beach, you know, where you're kind of just ripping through it. But considering that this is God's word, and reading it extremely slowly, extremely slowly, letting the words kind of like penetrate and like come into you, and then read it again, and then read it again. So like repetition is everything. That's why it's good to pick like a small passage and read it continually. And pay attention to the details. I liked the, the four W's I find really helpful. Consider who, what, when, and where. So like, who are the people involved in the scene? It's easiest to see this with like a scene in the Gospels, right? Like consider, okay, so it's Jesus, and there's these tax collectors and sinners there. And then you have the Pharisees, and the disciples are there. And so you kind of think about, all right, so who are all these people there? And you form kind of like an image in your mind. Like, I think this is most fruitful when you use your imagination too. Like, picture the scene. What? What happens? Jesus, you know, bends down and he heals the sick person. Or, uh, you know, Jairus' daughter, which we had a few weeks ago in the lectionary, is, is lying there dead. Jesus grabs her by the hand. So, like, really imagine. Like, think about what is happening. What is he doing? When? When is this happening? It might be helpful to notice, say, if you pick a passage, like Luke 15, like I have on here, it might be helpful, too, to look at, like, the passage that comes before it and the passage that comes after it. Like, when is this happening in, the, in like, the timeline? Because that can tell us a lot, right? Like, for example, at the Last Supper, when Jesus washes the disciples' feet, it's a really beautiful and striking image. Like, he's saying he's their Lord and Master, and here he is being a servant, but then what happens immediately after that? He goes to the crucifixion. So it's like almost like a foreshadowing of what it really means to serve your, for a man to lay down his life for his friends. And this is just the beginning of that. So considering when this happens helps us get more insight too. And where? Where? What's the place? This sometimes might require like a little bit more knowledge of the Bible, which again comes with time. You're not going to realize all of that stuff right away. But for example... Um, trying to think of a good example of this, like the Good Samaritan. A lot of people are familiar with the story of the Good Samaritan. So he's walking, the Good Samaritan, when he goes on this journey, is going, I think, from Jerusalem up to Jericho. Uh, and I forget exactly the meaning of this, but in the Old Testament, there's something really important that happens on that road. Like that's known as like a very dangerous route where it seems like people are going, like descending down towards like a dangerous place kind of a thing. That was probably a bad example because I don't remember the connection. <laughs> but for example, knowing where it is, if we have a little bit more of a knowledge, might help us get an even deeper insight in what happens. So pay attention to the details. Pay attention to the images. You know, like if we hear something like Jesus speaking about a parable of a vineyard, for example, which is something he'll reference a lot. We think about the image of a vineyard, and then all of a sudden we start to think of other places we see that in Scripture. Like, oh, in Psalm 80, he talks about like the people of Israel being like the Lord's vineyard. Um, and then we think, oh, John 15, like I am the vine, you are the branches. And like when we start making these connections, these are ways that can really take us deep, 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 because we see like the interconnectedness of all of scripture. So there's a book I, I have, and I'll talk about this a little bit at the end by Dr. Tim Gray. So he kind of gives a guide about Lexio Divina too. Um, that's helpful. So I'll, I'll present these books at the end. I have show and tell to do. But one thing he does helpful that I'm going to steal is he uses for like the steps of Lexio Divina, he compares it to making wine. And each step is like a different part. So he talks about the Lexio portion when we're just reading the text and seeing what's there as like collecting the grapes. Just seeing like what's there. You're gathering like this material so that you're kind of like getting ready for those next stages to, so that this can become something beautiful to nourish us. 
So the next step then is meditatio or meditation. And you know, meditation is a really misunderstood and overused word, I think, today. Because it's become now like a hip thing, like a very new agey thing, like to meditate. You know, even see like my sister is a, a, just got a job as a public school teacher. And uh, like the public schools now have like meditation rooms for kids. Um, and a lot of that is really steeped, I think, in a lot of like the Eastern traditions, like Eastern spiritual, like Buddhism thing, that kind of things. Where the goal of meditation is only to just like empty yourself. Like it's like enter into silence, which is a good thing. But the end goal of it is not to enter into a dialogue with someone else, but the end goal is to like empty yourself, to be like, like, a, like this self-emptying so that I just like disappear and become one with everything. And that's not really what this is. What this meditation is, is it's yes, quieting and like reflecting, but it's in a way where we wanna attach ourselves to something. We don't just wanna detach and be like this nebulous, like part of being itself kind of a thing. But I want to now, like, I, I have this raw material. I have these texts that I'm reading. Now I'm, like, chewing on it. I'm letting it stew in me. And so now it's, what does the text say to us? First it was, what does it say in itself? But now what does it say to us? And this is, I think, a really important part where pay attention to your heart. Like, listening to your heart and your mind, too. But what grabs your attention? You know, because if you're in that place where you're like quiet and you're like at this in this peaceful sort of disposition, then things are going to strike you. It might just be one word that really sticks out to you. Or it might be like one phrase or it might be one image, right? You, you picture Jesus with the, the woman caught in adultery and you're just like, you can't get your mind off that image and it's, you're attracted to it. Maybe it gives you peace. Maybe something like just calms you but you just pay attention to what goes on in you. That's what, that's what we're doing now. And, and Dr. Gray says, this is where you're like squeezing the grapes. Like you have these grapes now and now you're just squeezing them. You're seeing like, what's going on here? Where am I drawn? Where, where is my heart going? And I was told by a, a really wise Jesuit priest who was a, a, a spiritual director for like one of these retreats that we went on in the seminary. His big thing he kept saying to us is stay with the fruit. Stay with the fruit. I am like, I have like one of those type A personalities where I want to like get something done, kind of. And there might be a temptation when we do this, if we, we set out ahead of time. I want to pray with this passage in scripture. We feel like we need to get through the whole thing. You know, we, like we feel like we need to get it done. Like we need to get through everything. I need to meditate on every phrase in line. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. If you find fruit in one word, in one image, in one phrase, Stick with it. Just sit with it. Let the Lord speak to you in that. Because oftentimes, if something grabs us, if we're being drawn to something, that very well may be, and probably is, that the Holy Spirit wants us to focus on this for some reason. So don't fight that. You know, don't let your will take over, but be open. So if something really strikes you, one word, one phrase, one verse, stick with it. Stay with the fruit. Wherever you find the fruit, just rest in it. That's like one of the most important bits of advice I guess I could give in this is that it's not just a task, it's prayer. So if you feel drawn to something, stay with it because there's probably a reason why you're drawn to it. So then that brings us to the fourth part, which is oratio. So this is prayer. So we've read the text, we've chewed on it, and we start to see like we're drawn to certain words, certain images, certain phrases, and so now we, we start to enter into that dialogue of why am I drawn to this? You know, what is this? And so that's when we enter just into a conversation with the Lord of just like presenting it to him. Like, Lord, like, why are you, you know, why are you drawing me to this? What is it about this that, uh, that is inspiring me? What is it that you're trying to say to me through this? Think of like, uh, for example, this, like Martha and Mary, right? where Martha's doing all this stuff and Mary's just sitting there listening to everything Jesus says and Martha's getting really ticked off, you know, and she goes over to Jesus and, and she's like, like, Lord, how is this okay? Like, I'm doing all of this stuff. I'm busting my, you know, busting my hump to like put food on the table and Martha's just sitting here, you know, how is this okay? And then Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and worried about many things. Mary has found the one thing that's truly important. And for some reason, we're praying with that. And that really strikes us, that line. You're anxious and worried about many things. There's only one thing. 
And we just feel ourselves so drawn with that. And that's when you sort of like enter into that dialogue with the Lord. Like, Lord, why am I so anxious? Why am I so worried? What do I have to worry about? What do I need to like eliminate from my life just so I can sit at your feet like Mary? And so that's when we just sort of like, we speak to him just from the heart, wherever we are, whatever the circumstances are in our lives. But just like present that all there. Um, again, so I put a couple of questions there. What do we say to, to the Lord in response to his word? What word spoke to my heart? What did I sense the Lord saying to me? And then Gray uses the term, continuing with this wine-making analogy. This is when the grape juice is like fermenting. You're like, just like presenting it. It's all just like kind of stewing in there. You're asking these questions. You're resting in the word. And then comes contemplatio, contemplation. And this is the one that's kind of the scary word for us, right? It's that thing we hear like, contemplation is just for nuns and in cloisters. That's just for those Carmelites that I, I talked about last week. Contemplation is meant for people who completely remove themselves from the world. And that's not the case. But one of the big things that the documents of Vatican II uh, really emphasize is that a full and flourishing contemplative life is something that God intends for each and every person. Even people who work in the midst of the world, even for secular clergy, that a contemplative life is what everyone is called to. And so then this is where we just listen. We just listen. This is where you can kind of like, you know, you've been chewing on this word. You've been reflecting on these passages. Close the Bible and just sit there. Just sit there. And sometimes this won't go well. You know what I mean? Like sometimes it might not feel like fruitful. There might be times where, you know, after you present these needs to the Lord and you're just sitting there in silence, where you feel like you're getting an answer. You feel like, you're just convinced of like his presence with you at this moment. Your soul feels so at peace. Maybe things are coming to your mind like clearly of like where you might be called to conversion. You might like have clear, like maybe like people in your life will come to your mind who like kind of out of nowhere, like, oh man, like, is, is he wanting me to like be nicer to this person? Is he, am I being called to like go and do this? So this is the time to just listen. You know, you've spoken, you've meditated, you've sort of done the work. And now just kind of like let the Lord take over. And you might get distracted. In fact, most of the times you probably will. You know, like you'll find yourself kind of like your mind's drifting off all of a sudden. Don't freak out. Don't think you're a failure. But you just kind of like regroup. And contemplation really is a, it's kind of a gift, right? Like it, it might not be granted to be like this consoling time of prayer but the times when we need those consolations or if the Lord wants to give them to us, then he will. But they're not always going to come, right? We hear a lot of talk about the whole Mother Teresa going through that whole dark period where she had no, uh, like, consolation for years and years and years and years. So, like, there might be times when we're just not feeling it, quote, unquote. And you might find if you've never prayed like this before and really tried to enter into this contemplative prayer, and when you start meditating on the scriptures, in the beginning, it might seem like super fruitful. And like you might feel like uber consoled. And it's like the first time you've ever done this. And all of a sudden you're like, whoa, like God's really speaking to me. This is amazing. And then like as you keep doing it, then it stops. And then you're like, oh no, like Lord, why have you abandoned me? Like you, do you not love me anymore? And like there, it's not always going to be like good, touchy-feely, warm, fuzzy. There are going to be times where it's just very, it might feel kind of dry. But what we're kind of called to do is just like be faithful to that and kind of trust that like you're still praying, even if it doesn't feel like it, you know, like be willing to just rest there with the Lord and just be in his presence. And some of the saints talk about contemplation as a, de a definition of that. It's just a gaze of love. So even if nothing seems to be happening, just enter into that gaze of love. You know, this is easiest, I think, when we're in like Eucharistic adoration, because you can just stare at Jesus in the Eucharist, like just just be there, right? But even if not, like if you're doing this like in your room at home, because that's the only place where you can get away from everything, like just close your eyes and just sit there and rest in that, you know, and just try to be open to what the Lord might be saying to you. Sometimes you might taste the sweetness of the wine that's been fermenting, and other times you might not. But to just like be faithful to that, uh, enter into that gaze of love. I think that's going to be... Uh, this is what's going to really like kind of transform us. This is the time where the transformation takes place, right? This is the time when you surrender and then you like you let the Lord work in your soul. That's when the, the fires of the Holy Spirit kind of form you. Because one of the passages of scripture I find most um, 
consoling about this is, I think it's in Romans chapter 8, where St. Paul talks about how the Holy Spirit, like, teaches us to, like, we don't know how to pray as we ought. So the Holy Spirit, like, expresses our prayer through these unutterable groanings. So that even when, like, I don't know what's going on, I feel lost, there are these unutterable groanings that are going on that I am praying, even if I'm not feeling it. That's, like, the most important thing. Like, just don't get discouraged. Because there are going to be periods where you're going to feel nothing, or you're not going to feel like you're getting any insights, you know, but that's not always going to come. But when the Lord wants you to have those, he will give them, you know. So the, just trust in that. And then finally is the operatio. So this is like action, you know, because obviously if the word transforms us, then we are transformed and we need to change. Like it, it, it changes our course of action. Something is different now. I've encountered this presence I've entered into dialogue with God himself. He's forming me in, the, in my inmost being. And now, what do I do? Don't get overly preoccupied by this, like as thinking, you know, I need to have like a concrete resolution each and every day, <laughs> you know, of like something different. But yeah, the word should transform us. So it's good like at sort of, I find this helpful at the end of a time of prayer. Like say you want to beforehand say like, okay, I'm going to have, I have 30 minutes right now. At the end of that 30 minutes, then take a moment. And this is where I think journaling comes in, where it's really, really helpful. And this is what I do. And this is like my prayer every day. This is what I do. Is at the end of this time of prayer, I just like write something. It could even be like two sentences about like how the prayer went. So I'll record any like words or verses that just seem to stand out to me. If it felt kind of dry, I'll write that. Like kind of a dry period of prayer. But I like make note of it. And because... Our memories are so bad, you know, our, like uh, sometimes we might have like the most consoling like time of prayer in the morning, for example. And we think like, I just had an encounter with like the living God. Like everything is different now. This is amazing. And then like, as soon as we, you know, go downstairs and like talk to our husband or our wife or something, you like forget all about it. So I feel like writing it down, like concretizes it where it like kind of just stays with you. And I think that's where this helps with operatio, where like, now, this time of prayer has happened. Now, how do I translate this? So I think even just writing out like how the prayer went helps like it, with that transition period. Like now we're going from this time like into normal life, but it's still me and that still happened. And I don't forget that that happened. So that's kind of like the method. This is my, like one of my favorite ways to pray. Um, I think it's a great way to enter into the contemplative life. Some of the saints like John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila will talk about how as people like advance in the mystical life, like meditation and this like kind of disappears because then like the soul has become so close to the Lord where they're just like entering into this constant dialogue. But most of us are still slugging it out in the purgative way, myself included, and probably will be for the rest of our lives. But that doesn't, that shouldn't be like a discouragement to us from entering into this. This is like, we're all called to the contemplative life. And this is a wonderful way to do that and be able to like listen to the Lord's voice. So I want to just conclude before we pray together with a couple practical suggestions. A lot of people have at, will probably ask about like what translations of the Bible are good. One thing that was told to me by a scripture professor sometimes, because you can be kind of scandalized sometimes, like when you start to like strut, like study the scriptures and you can see like what different Greek words mean and stuff. You're like, oh my gosh, like we missed the point. Translations, the word of God is inspired translations are not inspired, you know? So like there could be like different ways where a word is translated in one way that probably wasn't like the original kind of intention with it. So I put a couple just different like translations that are very trustworthy and good. Because an important thing, especially for us as Catholics, is to get like in a Catholic edition of the Bible. Because there will be some, you know, fallen human beings in translating the Bible, some people of different like Christian confessions will translate a certain word to reflect their theology because they don't want to show like, like, oh, if we don't believe in the true presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, we might translate one of these words like slightly differently to show like some kind of nuance that, oh, he just means like, like his body or like that it makes us recall his body. One example too is there are some translations of the Bible. There's a really important uh, like term that is used time and time again in the gospels is the son of man, right? We hear that a lot. Like the son of man did not come for this, the son of man. It comes, there's like a prophecy in Daniel talking about the son of man as like this glorious coming of the Messiah. 
and obviously Jesus uses it in the Gospels, some translations of the Bible will translate it as human being, um, which completely like misses the point. You know, so like there are things like that where it's important to have a good translation. I personally really like the RSV, the Revised Standard Version. That is not what we use at Mass. The one we use at Mass is the New American Bible, which is really, really good. And if you're using that, you will not be led astray. Uh, I've been told just like in classes that the RSV tends to be like a little bit more faithful, I guess, to the original Greek. So it's a little bit better for like academic study. And that's kind of why I had gotten it. Um, but the NAB is probably what most of us would pray with. And if you're doing that, no need to fear. Like you're in good shape. That's what we use at mass. So I like the RSV. I've been told the NRSV, because they like redid the RSV. And so they call it the new revised standard version is not as good as the original RSV. <laughs> so just some things to consider. Um, and there's also the, the Jerusalem Bible is very good. Some people like the Jerusalem Bible. They have a cool feature where like in every like passage on the side margin, they'll give you all these other scriptural citations that are like connected to that. So some people find that really helpful. Um, so that's a good one. And at the end of the day, any Catholic edition of the Bible is, is good because we also, as many might know, but some might not, we have like a different canon of scripture than Protestants do. Um, like some Protestants don't accept some of the books that we accept. For example, like the Book of Wisdom, um, First and Second Maccabees, Tobit, uh, Esther. So there's like a couple, mostly Old Testament books that Protestants like reject as canonical, but we accept them. Um, so it's important to have like a Catholic edition to the Bible. But if you find yourself like in a place where like the only Bible you have is just like a good news Bible or something like that, like don't be... Don't let that prevent you from entering in, you know, like any scripture, it's still scripture, you know, so, so don't be afraid of that. But if you have the resources at hand to get like a good Catholic edition of the Bible, that's good. Now, sometimes when we're praying, there might be something like that just puzzles us. We don't understand. So it's helpful to read like commentaries sometimes just to give us more insight and sometimes understanding like historical context, especially if things in the Old Testament that might seem really obscure to us can help us enter into the prayer and understand like what is meant by this. Like why is Jeremiah denouncing these shepherds? You know, why is this king important? And so sometimes reading like a commentary can like help open up a whole another side of this. So I just brought a couple things that are really helpful. The first is this. So um, there's a series that they put out sort of headed by, many of you have probably heard of Scott Hahn and a lot of those guys from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. Uh, Mary Healy is kind of like the editor-in-chief of this. There's a whole series called The Catholic Commentary on Sacred Scripture. Um, these are put out, they're written by Catholics, for Catholics. Uh, they only have the, old, the New Testament books done as of yet, but they're really, really good. They're not overly academic, which is nice. So it, it's like any like, layman can access this and get immense spiritual fruit from this. I know some parishes do like scripture studies with these books because they find it really helpful, but they'll show lots of like connections. Like for example, I'm looking at a page right now in the gospel of Luke, um, where Jesus tells the disciples like put out into the deep, right? And it has like a little quote about how John Paul II used this like all the time in his work, like with vocations. They'll give you uh, passages from the catechism uh, so it's got all kinds of cool stuff. So they'll give you like sort of context, um, crack open different words and phrases and confusing historical things. It's got pictures in it. Everyone likes pictures, <laughs> uh, even when we're adults. And then a nice thing they'll do at the end of each chapter is they do like reflection and application. So it'll show you like in concretely, how can I put this into practice in my life? So it's really down to earth. It's really helpful. I use them all the time. So they have them for all the books of the New Testament now are out. So that's another thing I would recommend. I don't have it with me, but there's also the Ignatius Catholic Study Bible. I put it on your little handout there. They only have done right now the New Testament, where it basically will have the whole Bible, or the, the whole like New Testament, and half of the page on the bottom is all notes. So it really is really good, where you, like, you can have the Bible there, you can use that for your prayer, and if something you're like, wait, what does that mean? You can like look down at the bottom of the page and it might have a note that can help you about it. That's really helpful. Um, 
I have this book I brought too. This, maybe not as much, um, but it's really, really helpful. It's called A Catholic Introduction to the Bible, the Old Testament. I bought this, uh, it only came out a couple years ago. It is amazing, absolutely amazing. We're, it's very down to earth. Again, not overly like pie in the sky academic. You know, it's not like just giving you etymologies of words the entire time, which sometimes if you read a biblical commentary, that's all it will be is like defining words. Um, but it gives you like an introduction to every book of the Old Testament. It gives you an outline of the, a background of historical context. Um, and then it'll deal with like theological issues, like of like how can God possibly like allow them to kill these people and say that's okay. And like, they'll kind of dive into some of that stuff. And then at the end of each chapter, they have like a chart where they show where passages from this book appears in mass the entire year. It'll show you like, oh, so uh, for the book of, first book of Samuel, chapter three, verses one to 10, it gives a description. Samuel hears the voice of the Lord calling to him within the tabernacle. It tells you when this is used at mass and then it'll give you an explanation of why that reading is chosen for that mass. Kind of, so it's really, really nice for that. I use this for homilies all the time. It's really, really helpful. Um, it's called A Catholic Introduction to the Bible, the Old Testament, by John Bergsma and Brant Petre. And then lastly, there's just this book. If you want to learn more about Lexio Divina, awesome, really simple, only like 100 pages. Dr. Tim Gray, who is the head of the Augustine Institute out in Denver, they do all kinds of amazing work trying to make the scriptures accessible to people. It's called Praying Scripture for a Change, an Introduction to Lexio Divina. And he'll go step by step, and he's really interesting. He'll use lots of like images and stories to kind of help you understand this. But this is a really, really helpful book. So if you leave today feeling overwhelmed, this I would highly recommend this. Um, so that's all my show and tell of books and stuff. Um, so why don't we take a moment then, we'll, Pray for a little bit. Now, this is obviously Lexio Divina in a group this big is probably not as effective as it probably could be in like a smaller group. And we also don't have a ton of time. I don't want to take a lot of time. But I think it's helpful if we like kind of do this together, just to kind of see the method in play if we've never ever done it. And um, so what we'll do is like obviously we'll we'll take like just a minute to kind of quiet ourselves. I'll read the passage through slowly. I'll ask someone else to read the passage through slowly, because sometimes hearing another person's voice and inflections could give us a different insight into it. We'll take just like a couple minutes of silence just to see what strikes us. And then uh, at the end, I'll open it up if people want to share something. Again, there's no pressure. And sometimes my complaint about group Lexio Divina is that sometimes you feel pressured to like have to say something, and it feels like it rushes the process, because it kind of does. Um, especially in this kind of a short time. But I think it's good if we just do it together anyways. Um, and I chose this passage for a reason, but I'll say that reason after we do it. So why don't we just take a moment to quiet ourselves and to consider that the, the Lord is looking at us and prepare ourselves to receive whatever it is that he wants to tell us through this passage. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. So now we just consider 
there are any words or phrases or images that stand out to us. I get a volunteer to maybe read the passage for us again? Yeah, sure, right here. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share? I know this is a very short time. It seems kind of forced. But if there's anything that stood out to you, like a, a word or a phrase or maybe like a way you like imagined one of the verses there. Yeah, Jens. So uh, I've read this so many times, like all of us have, but mm-hmm. the, the first time I'm looking at it where I, the words hear him come out, Hmm. told them he calls together his friends and I tell you so you, your senses of hearing and speaking you know hearing the word of God and having the Lord speak to us through Jesus well God is Jesus but you know yeah. you, you know what I'm saying yeah, yeah. that kind of a connection of course the obvious intent of everything mm-hmm. you know, the Lord's but the manner I guess in which he's Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, over here, Liz. I like when um, where it says, and when he was, and when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders. Mm-hmm. And it just uh, the part that says he lays it on his shoulders because when we rest on the Lord, we know His yoke is light, right? Mm-hmm. He wants us to hold on to him. And um, and that's just what it reminds me of. And um, where it says, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So, um, you know, I know the Lord wants us to repent and, um, you know, and come Mm-hmm. Yeah. He just brings us back to him, and um, <coughs> you know, like he, like with the, uh, that song with by Warren Daigle, you know, hold on to me. 
Mm -hmm. that song. And, um, or even like Francesca Battistelli, she did Defender, you know, where Jesus, where God is Defender of, of our hearts, and he picks up all of our pieces and puts us back together. And uh, he reintroduces us to his love. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I find that a lot of, I love music too. So a lot of times like things will hearken to like a song that helps take me deeper too. Like don't ignore that if that kind of arises in you. Yeah. You had a, yeah, right here. Yes. Um, I think it speaks of the depth of the personal relationship Jesus wants with each of us. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, alluding to your message about the senses the touching, so he wants to touch us and connect with us, and his rejoicing, um, he then wants you to share that with others. Um, and um, I just, that's all. Yeah, thank you. Maybe one or two more. Yeah, here in the front. Um, what struck me was this man receives sinners and eats with them and what I was getting out of that was the need to be more inclusive and opening in our, the way we view other people hmm. you know they're viewing these people as sinners that doesn't mean they necessarily are hmm. but sometimes are we not as inclusive as we should be in inviting people yeah, That's what I kind of in connection with that, one thing that, that struck me with it was him talking to the, the Pharisees and scribes, or the, uh, yeah, the Pharisees and scribes was, uh, sometimes it's a helpful with this, like think about when you imagine the scene, like where do you find yourself? And I found myself with the Pharisees and scribes, um, and this notion of like, I'm lost, <laughs> like I'm the lost sheep, you know? Think it's helpful kind of uh, that kind of struck me on this so kind of in connection with that uh maybe one more if anyone wants to share yeah i'm very literal mm -hmm. so uh, this time he struggles terribly with depression and mm. debilitating depression so <clears throat> i see this as a literal lost sheep you know like yeah friends family leaves children with addictions family members like yeah that. Mm, and yes. Once, once, what was once lost is found. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that I try to keep out the intrusive thoughts of, well, how's Peter right now? How's Peter? Right, that's tough, and yeah. What am I doing after I leave here? Right? And, and yeah. to, to really shut that off it is really difficult. But yeah. then to take the literal, and I had the thought, what you were saying about the Pharisees, about kind of that place of judgment to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, so great. This is awesome. Thank you. So some people will include as one of the steps in like that process I had there, like discussion. You know, it's a big thing. A lot of like religious communities will do this as a community. We do it in the, at the seminary sometimes, like as classes or in groups, because sometimes it's just really fruitful to hear how the word struck someone else um, can open up another door for us. And uh, Janice, you had said something at the beginning that was a really important point, too. Of it's easy, like, if we're praying with a passage we've heard a bunch of times, to, like, kind of write it off from the get-go, you're like, oh, lost sheep again. Like, I know what that means. You know, I know what, like, I'm supposed to get for that. But like that quote from Hebrews that I read at the beginning, the word is living and active. Like, in every moment, it's alive. There's a person behind those pages. It's not just a book we read. So that a passage that we meditate time and time and time again can always have something new to say to us. And that's why uh, in, there's a document the church put out called the homiletic directory. So it's supposed to be for priests and seminarians who are preparing to give homilies. 
and they propose as the method to prepare to preach is doing Lexio Divina. Like, necessarily must be the first stage in preparation to preach. And that's what I do, and I know a lot of other priests do that too, of you can't just get up there, it's not just about teaching a lesson, but it's about helping foster an encounter with people, with the living God in his word, which then leads us to the Eucharist. And so at each and every moment, the Lord has something different to say to particular people in particular communities. And so we can hear, that's why a lot of, like Fulton Sheen, I know people probably have heard of Fulton Sheen, never saved one of his sermons. He would always, he would write it out, he would learn it, and then he would throw it out so that he was never tempted to just like assume the same thing again, but to always like live that living relationship with the word and the people whom he was called to preach. And so I think I'll just conclude this, um, and then if people have a couple questions, but we've been at about an hour now, um, of saying that one of the greatest benefits of this is not just for our own personal prayer life, but maybe if you're struggling to think about like, where do I start? Or like, what are some passages? Lexio Divina is a perfect way to prepare ourselves for mass. Because that's, there's a very intentional reason why at every Eucharistic celebration, at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, we begin with readings from Scripture, and then we conclude with the Eucharist. And that is how his presence in the Word prepares our hearts. It tills the soil so that we can receive his very presence in the Eucharist. And so sometimes, if we do this, like, with the readings for Mass, you know, think like uh, sometime during the week, you, you want to pray with the Sunday readings for the week upcoming, then when you're at Mass, you can pray the Mass so much deeper because, like, you've already, like, wrestled with this. And you've already, like, sort of heard the, heard the, heard the Lord speak to you with this particular, like, t passages. So then at Mass, instead of just, like, looking around and worrying about how so-and-so like doesn't use the microphone correctly or like i can't stand like father's voice and oh my gosh deacon steve's face is so red <laughs> uh, but then you've already like wrestled with this uh wrestled with the word and you're still able to like get fruit from mass and it makes you just pray so much more deeply um so yeah if there's uh any questions maybe before we kind of wrap up with a prayer and before joe does his public service announcements Shoot. <laughs> How do you get to where you uh, start? How do you choose the reading? Do you just open the Bible and go to it? How yeah, do you usually not. I, this is why sometimes it's helpful if you have like a spiritual director. Um, but it kind of depends on where you are in your life, too. You know, like for example, uh, I was going to print out a document. I just forgot to. I have like this document that was given to me on an Ignatian retreat where it gives you lists of scripture passages for like different situations. So, for example, if I'm feeling, like, really anxious, you know, or I'm really nervous about something, then I might want to meditate specifically on a passage that I know is about, like, consolation given by God, you know. So it, it depends on the circumstances you're, you're in can influence it. One thing is you could pick daily mass readings, and that's kind of what I do, especially now since I have to preach so often, that I kind of try to make the liturgy, like, the fount that it kind of springs from, so... So, because there you're given short passages each and every day that are already kind of like given to you. So if you really don't know where to go, I think that's a great place to start for everyone because there's passages given to you. You don't have sort of that stress of having to, you know, pick something because um, it can be overwhelming, right? You have like this giant book with all these passages and it's all supposed to be inspired. So it all should be, you know, fruitful for me. So uh, I know some people who play like Bible roulette, they call it, where like you just like open up a random page and like, okay, that's what I'm going to do today. Um, uh, now, I know people who have actually had really powerful, you know, like interventions through that of like asking for inspiration in a situation in their life and they've received it by like a random passage. I'm not dismissing that and I don't want to make light of that, but it might not be helpful for you to just pick up Leviticus. Like, let's, uh, let's take a passage and be like, Okay, Lord, like I'm putting myself in your presence. Like, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Come, Holy Spirit. And there went forth a wind from the Lord, and it brought quails from the sea. And let them fall beside the camp about a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side. Like, I'm not going to pray about the quails. That doesn't mean you can't. Like, it could lead to some kind of fruitful meditation. Like, okay, the Lord is providing for his people's needs, like in their time of hunger. They haven't had meat. They're in the desert. But it might be a little bit of a difficult entryway, you know, especially if this is like kind of a new thing. So I share that document that you 
Maybe I can, yeah. Maybe I'll send it to Joe and great. yeah. Thank you. And then if if not the daily mass readings, then I think a helpful thing, start with the gospels. And even if you're just like go through the gospels, read a chapter a day or one section a day, depending on what strikes you. Again, you don't want to my hesitation with that method would just be like you feel like you need to just keep advancing through the gospel. And if something is striking you, you might be like inclined to just move beyond it because you want to keep going forward in the gospel. I want to keep my routine of getting through like one chapter a day. That would be the only danger with that. But if you don't know where to start, I think that can be good. Just work your way through a gospel. Pick like, you know what? I'm going to read the gospel of Luke, you know, because Luke talks so much about like the need for outreach to the poor and he talks about mercy and there's a lot of passages about Mary in it. So maybe I want to meditate with Luke and just like working your way slowly through that. But that's a really good question. I'm glad you brought that up. Anyone else? Okay, great. Well, why don't I, we wrap up with a prayer, and then I'll turn it over to Joe. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. All right, Joe. Okay, thank you. All right, a couple things. Um, again, if you if you want to receive emails from me, make sure uh, Ginny has your email, and uh, I'll send out. I, I can send out the uh, the handout because there may be oh, people yeah. that aren't here, mm -hmm. and also the list of uh, passages. Yeah. So I'll include that on the email to everybody. Um, a couple upcoming events. Uh, so on th every Thursday morning after Mass, uh, there's an ongoing series, the Bible and the Virgin Mary, and there it's ongoing, and it'll be continuing to. September the 2nd, but they welcome walk-ins, so if that's something that interests you, uh, you can do that. And just an intervention. I went to it last Thursday for the first time, and it's awesome. There I you go. Recommend it. There's, like, there's these really good videos that they do, um, and then like you kind of discuss the videos. It's really, really good. Yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, and on uh, Wednesdays, at after the 4 o'clock Mass, down at our Lady of Good Counsel, they have a discussion group or reflection group on the upcoming Sunday readings that you're invited to attend. Mm -hmm. And we also have it here after the, on Friday after the morning mass. Uh, Sam Fulginetti runs that. In fact, he does a, a version of Lectio Divina uh, to prepare people for the Sunday reading. So you're invited to join, and that's in the library after the 8.30 mass here. Uh, next week, Next week, Father Thomas will be standing here, and he's going to be discussing St. Joseph, his relevance for today. Of course, this is the year of St. Joseph, so you're all invited to come back for that. A lot of things going on. Um, and uh, just in general, uh, we're, we're looking uh, to start up an RCIA process in September, and that's, uh, uh, that's a process or a program to introduce people to the Catholic faith if they're interested in that. So if you know of anybody that would be, you think might be interested in finding out more about the Catholic faith, uh, you can have them contact me. We'll be starting up something in September. And let's see. Oh, and, and again, if you're interested in one of these books, Jenny has a couple of them there. I think that's all. Oh yeah, one more announcement too. Okay, go ahead. Um, and this explains, I forgot to mention this, why I picked this passage uh, so tonight at 7 at St. Augustine's is one of our like vigils of song um, oh, right. that we do. If anyone's been to it, it's pretty cool. So it's an hour of adoration. Patrick does a lot of like, praise and worship music during it. It's really, really good. Uh, and I'm going to preach on this passage. So that's why I actually like brought it today so that people could pray with it to cheat and see if Get I got some ideas. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's 7, seven o'clock tonight. Yeah. 7 o'clock tonight, St. Augustine Church. Yeah. You know, you can... Will there be a feedback sheet? <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Uh, maybe you can give us a blessing. Yes, yeah, sure. So the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you, God. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great day.